right. So again, I'm going to be talking about um, the the hatch window and how important it is in incubation process. And it's really a good tool, not just to measure how our, our hatchery is operating, the efficiency in which it's operating, but also gives us an inside window, so to speak, of our chicks and chick quality and what we can expect from the chicks. Um, real quickly, I just kind of wanted to go through a little bit of history of incubation of um, had opportunity in the last little bit to uh, kind of do some reading on this topic and kind of refresh my memory on some things and find it really interesting how long artificial incubation, the practice of artificial incubation has been um, in place. We know writings back um, 400 BC that talk about the Egyptians incubating eggs using dung heaps or, or um, the fecal, fecal material. The Chinese developed artificial incubation as early as 246 BC. And some of these early methods um, used at that time, very large scale incubators, maybe up to 36,000 eggs in an incubator, which is quite impressive for it at that time period. Um, when really up until that point, um, you know, people were using setting hands. So we can see some of the, the description here of, um, let me get the laser pointer, of what the artists picture some of these um, egg ovens, some people call them, where they um, heated the eggs to incubate them. And, and some modern day use of these similar type of equipment is still going on um, just from a, you know, a, a method of how it's um, going on trying to keep culture and tradition alive, I think. Um, that The process of artificial incubation is interesting in, in some of the reading that you know, it, what they were doing down in the Egyptian area, they tried to take the same process up to Europe. Didn't work very well because it's a colder climate. They couldn't get the heat. So they abandoned the same method they were using in down in Egypt. In here in North America, United States, um, the first patent, official patent for an incubator back to 1844, um, Smith incubator. Um, we can see different types of incubators at the time. Um, that uh, were used and developed and part of, part of the reason why the, the poultry industry was able to rapidly develop as it was. We can see this old incubator here, a, a old Buckeye, a Peter Simon incubator, and then an old Smith or from James Manufacturing, one of our um, old incubators. So you see how they look like um, back when. Um, in, in some of the reading here, it's interesting. I go back to some of the really old um, articles, not necessarily the most scientific, it's interesting to see how much um, knowledge and understanding they had. A uh, good article written um, about the history of incubation, a USDA publication came out a few years ago. Um, big old poultry book, 1917, running of an incubator with a few eggs in it to learn how to manage it. I think that applies today. I think everybody needs to gain that experience on how to operate machines. Even those old machines from 100 years ago, there's an art to it. We know how they're supposed to work and there's an art to it. So they recommended people run a few, um, do some experimental hatches to really understand how to operate those machines. This was interesting as well. Again, this is hundred years ago. The best location was in a room where mild and fairly uniform temperatures could be preserved with minimal changes. This is what we do now in our hatcheries. You know, we try and control the hallways. And the, and the exhaust plenums to maintain a uniform environment so the machines are able to work um, as well as they can. So I thought this was interesting that um, even back then they had the same understanding. A couple of other old publications, um, The Hen at Work, Common Sense and Poultry Raising. Um, th did some studies on the setting hen. Um, it kind of gave fuel to both old and modern um, incubation that, that was developing at that time. But one of the main things they can't use exactly the temperatures and the conditions the hen um, provided was those eggs were all heated through direct contact with a brood patch. So you actually had different levels of temperature from the direct contact on one side. So turning was quite important um, for that hen, um, but the temperatures are also a little bit warmer than what we would recommend because we use um, um, heating or controlling the air um, environment. And looking at some of these old incubators, um, the original incubator, the hen sitting in the eggs. Um, I don't know how many of you did that. I've seen many, many hens set on eggs, both as a kid and as a researcher at the University of Arkansas. When I was there, I, I put thermometers under hens and watched them 
incubate eggs and recorded when they got off, how often they got off, um, what happened to the temperature of the eggs. Kind of a depiction of that Chinese incubator. You had a charcoal fire and you had ashes and you had your eggs sitting in this top here that they would then um, be able to sample the eggs. And one of the ways that they would sample the temperature of the eggs is take the egg up and put it on the eyelid, their, their own eyelid because that's a very sensitive part of the body and they can get a feel for if that egg's too warm or too cold. Even then they had an understanding of maintaining that proper temperature and maintaining it throughout the, the mass of eggs. And then we kind of evolved into, um, you know, some of the older redwood type of things. You still see a few of these. Um, I've actually had a couple in my time, um, just a different style of incubator. So when we look at the basics of incubation, and I show this in a lot of presentations I do, because it really is just the four simple things of incubating eggs. We have to provide the proper temperature. Um, we have to provide the proper humidity and the ventilation has to be correct. And then of course, turning the eggs um, so they have em embryo movement within that egg and also altering that ventilation throughout that, that uh, cabinet. But that temperature is what really controls the growth rate faster or slower. So if we remember that, that temperature, when we start looking at um, later on in any part of our incubation process, we start seeing slow hatch, fast hatches, or a combination of those in, in a same day's hatch, we start looking back, okay, what's happened with our temperature? Because that's really what is controlling uh, the rate of growth. So when we look at what a mother, mother hen does, what, what happens in mother nature? I always like to go back to that. I remember um, some readings years ago and even talking about how we manage birds is we always say we want to find out what birds or animals will, how they behave in nature so we can modify their natural um, um, habits or inclinations they have to fit our management. We can't really make them do something that they wouldn't normally do, but we try to modify it. So we need to know what a hen is doing how she is able to sit on the eggs through all different times of temperatures and environment. I, I grew up in Arizona and it was hot in Arizona. And, you know, I'd have hens sit on eggs and wonder why in the world they're not on the eggs all the time. Well, it's too hot. And so they, they had to manage that for whatever environment they're in. So we're really trying to mimic um, mother nature and create an environment from beginning to end that the broody hen would, would do herself for the eggs and the developing embryos and the, um, the newly hatched chicks or poults or ducklings, whatever, whatever it may be. So in some of the readings I do, and of course, I always like to stick to the, the science, um, the, the tried and true methods of science. Referee journal articles is, you know, is really the way to go if you really want to know something is, is correct, it's, it's uh, data is accurate. It's got to be a, a referee journal publication, meaning that, that the publication has gone into the hands of other researchers and scientists to critique it, to make sure they had a proper protocol and um, experimental design and set up an analysis of the data. Um, so we want to do that, but then we also want to um, see what you know others have found and evaluate that. So I, I go sometimes away from some of the the just hard and true scientific methods and read some of these old books. Um, these down here, and I've got a nice little collection of books in my, in my house here from, you know, 100, more than 100 years old. And some of these are really interesting to read because some of the principles and understanding they had at that time through just um, observations and practical poultry husbandry or animal husbandry practices really hold true today. Now, some of them are a little off the wall, but, um, you know, other books like ornithology, we look at things other than just chickens, all birds, avian incubation, nest eggs and incubation, a couple of really good books that really get into um, some of the incubation practices of not just our domesticated fowl, but other birds in general. Again, so we can learn some things from, um, the, from all the birds. So how does a hen control the environment? They do it through what's called attentiveness meaning that a hen will get on or off the eggs accordingly to what the environmental stimuli tell her. For instance, if it's, if it's really cold, 
she will sit tighter on the eggs for longer periods of time. It's really hot, she'll get off more, particularly in that last week when the embryos are producing so much heat. We can see a, a hen, a bird, a chicken, duck, turkey, whatever, will start getting off the eggs a lot more. And they've got to let those eggs breathe. They've got to let that heat um, escape. And so a hen is controlling um, that through the amount of time she sits on the, on the nest. On average, hens, um, uh, well, hens have stayed on the nest without leaving for about 14 days. Um, some of the other research says about 12 days is when you really start seeing a noticeable difference where they start getting off the nest more frequently. Um, and, and that's the attentiveness and they monitor that. They also, you know, a, a, a highly fertile nest of eggs that's producing more heat. They will get off those eggs more frequently than one that has very few fertile eggs and is producing less heat, they, they know. So we're, we're trying to monitor what they do and kind of follow the same thing. So if we look at different types of eggs, um, birds, these are, these are um, both, Galliforms are chickens, turkeys, ducks, pheasant, quail, and uh, the perching birds, I like to call them, passerines, but all the perching birds. And they produce a distinctly different type of um, egg and a different type of chick. So let's look at the egg development. And this is really just to show you how biology um, is different in the biology and the physiology of the eggs and the chicks and the development is different depending on the the process or the degree at which that bird needs to be active when it hatches. Altricial basically is those um, birds like songbirds. They sit in the nest for um, after they hatch. They sit, they have to be fed by the parents right away. And I'll show you a little bit the difference in the whole composition of the egg. And precocial would be like our chickens, turkeys, ducks. The initial composition of those eggs really reflects the degree of hatching maturity. Um, so the egg itself is developing in a manner to match whether this is a precocial chick and will undergo those um, circumstances of life at hatching and after hatching or an ultrasal chick where they are bound to that nest for, for days or weeks till the parents feed them. The composition of the eggs is determined by the energy demands of the embryo and the subsequent chick. And again, this follows along with the, the nature of the chick, whether it's um, designated to be an ultracial or precocial. We can see here precocial, which will be our chickens, turkeys, ducks, that will have this dark area here is the amount of yolk. So you'll have about almost 60% of the egg will be yolk and the rest egg white. And we get down here to some of the altricial where we have much less, maybe half the amount of yolk. So the egg is developing to meet the needs of that chick when it hatches. And so we can look at the energy content consumption as well. For our precocial chicks here, percent water content. And those are altricial ones that um, are, are the nesting birds type of thing. Um, so Biology, the physiology, growth of the, and development of that egg is different for these two bird types. <clears throat> so the altricial birds, again, the songbirds, the eggs are water rich, energy poor. They're lower in triacylglycerides um, and higher in phospholipids, higher in albumin content to yolk content. Precocial is what we typically are hatching. The water poor, energy rich higher energy, um, their yolks are higher in energy from the triacylglycerides, lower albumin content. We discussed some of that. Look at the birds themselves. They obviously are very different in the way they act. These altricial chicks are naked. They cannot control their, their temperature at all. They can't see. They're 100% dependent on the parent um, for, for several weeks sometimes. I was watching something the other night that um, a bird was, has to stay with the parents for up to two years, a condor down in South America, um, as the parents continue to feed it and train it and learn. In our, in our precocial bird chickens and stuff, where it's very different. They hatch out and they're ready to go. This is what has allowed our industry to, to grow like it has, is we can hatch a bunch of chicks and create a house and environment that they, right away, they can go and start eating and drinking once they hit the ground in that in that chicken house or, or turkey house and 
we don't need the parents for that. So the artificial incubations work really well with, um, with our industry because we can take the chicks right away um, from the parents. So looking at um, some of the birds that we raise, the ducks, turkeys, chickens, about a 40 to 45% yolk content compared to um, some of the other birds like little terns and, and finches that we see very low yolk content. Um, again, this is how the chicks are developing. So chick development, the altricial chicks, they hatch, they're not very well developed. So that, that low amount of yolk content they don't need that as much once they hatch because the parents are feeding them right away. So that proportion of yolk to albumin is different in that they hatch and they're dependent on the parents. They're often naked, lacking any down. They're immobile, cannot fly or walk. They're confined to the nest. Most of these are gonna be up in trees. So your predation's not as much of an issue. Um, energy goes into the parental care after the hatch. So that's why they don't have as much energy there because the parents are providing that right after hatch. That's how the birds were um, developed and grown. And that's what the egg, the composition of the egg um, is, is preparing them for. Precocial chicks, a young hatch almost fully developed. Their eyes are open, they're covered in down, they're active and they're mobile. They're not confined to the nest. The energy goes into the prenatal development. So those are given all that energy required during the prenatal development prior to hatch to, to prepare them for this period of time when they do hatch and the parents eventually take them uh, to source food and water. So look at the hatching process of these, um, these two bird types, altricial. Hatch synchronization is not as important. Why is it not as important? Um, because they're not leaving the nest. I, I've um, had the opportunity to, to really watch and monitor some birds in, in, in trees or, or outside in a, in a porch, I guess, where I could watch them. Sometimes you'll see these chicks hatch two, three, and four days apart because a hen will lay an egg. She'll often lay that second egg and then start sitting. And she might not lay a third egg for two days later and a fourth egg for maybe two more days after that. So there's naturally a big range in there because she starts sitting on the first eggs right after lay and then adds more to the clutch. So it really is not possible and it's not that important because the, the bird's parents then come back and are feeding the, the chicks um, until they're ready to fledge and they'll fledge at different times as well. Young hatch when ready and they're fed at the time of hatch. So when they're ready, they hatch, parents are feeding them right away. So anchor, asynchronous hatching, um, incubation begins at lay, like I said. Right at the time of lay, for the most part, they'll start incubating the eggs and so you have a natural time period of several days apart. Um, and I've seen like in zoos and, and I've followed some of these other species for a long time, you can see a very big difference sometimes from the oldest and the youngest in a clutch. Um, and that's just the nature of those birds because they're meant to be fed by the parents after they hatch. Precocial, hatch synchronized by chick embryos clicking to communicate hatch time. This is a pretty interesting um, uh, process that as the chicks get close to that hatch in the last couple of days, um, they, they can emit, it's called a clicking sound. And it's really not necessarily a click click from their beak, but it's a, a series of different sounds that the chicks in the nest can communicate to each other. And those that are a little behind in development can speed up. Those that are a little bit ahead will slow down. As long as the eggs are touching each other in the nest, they'll communicate to try and synchronize that hatch. Why is it important for them to have a synchronized hatch? Is because their nature's intended them to all hatch in a very tight uh, range of time and then exit the nest together with a parent to start looking for um, food and water. That clicking can create an earlier hatch date um, by speeding up those that are a little bit behind. We, we see this in some altricial birds, but not as many because it, it's, it's there's not a need for it in nature and in the where they're living. So the synchronous hatching um, incubation begins after all the eggs are laid. So you will rarely see in our um, birds that we've domesticated, chickens, turkeys, ducks, pheasant, quail, they won't start sitting on the collection of eggs until they're all laid. So they'll lay 10, 11, 12, 13 eggs, however many they're gonna lay. And often in consecutive days, 
first eggs actually have a little bit different composition of that egg structure as compared to the very last of that clutch because those are meant to sit there for 10 to 12 days until incubation starts, but it all starts at the same time. And that be, is because they're intended on hatching at the same time so the hen can take them off the nest to go look for food and water. It's a survival mechanism for them to um, be able to find food and water together, but also gets them all out of the nest. So if the hen takes off and leaves a few of them there, um, predation is, a, is likely an issue. And also that, that chicks may still be wet, not ready to, to leave. So they have this process of synchronizing the hatch. So the hatch window in altricial birds, like our little songbirds here, may be as long as two to four days or longer. We can see in this nest here, these birds here are are quite a bit more developed than these guys. And so that mo the mother will come in and feed them as they're begging. And, and we see that, but we do have those that might be several days older than the others. It's not an issue because the mother's still feeding all of those that are hungry. I guess these two little ones here are the most hungry because their heads are sticking up higher and squawking more probably because that older sibling there was taller and bigger and took all the food the first time mom came to feed them. The chicks hatching in the precocial environment, hatching window can be as short as two to four hours in the wild mallard duck. Um, and that's a very short hatch window. Uh, and, a, and 24 hours um, in other galliforms or landfowl, like our chicken, turkeys, and ducks. Again, that's the nature of these birds, how the eggs are developed, how the incubation process occurs. This is what happens in nature following that hatch, um, the incubation time and hatching. So just kind of wrapping up a little bit of our precocial chicks. This would include our chickens, turkeys, ducks, pheasant, quail, land, a lot of landfowl, including waterfowl. Um, the hen will lay her clutch of eggs over a period of several days, depending on the clutch size, but she'll not begin incubating the eggs till all the eggs are laid. They wanna maintain a narrow hatch window, the mother does this, as the newly had chicks will all need to be escorted together by the mother away from the nest site in search of food. So these are the ones that we are typically hatching, whether it be chickens, turkeys, ducks, um, geese, whatever. Um, nature has said we want a narrow hatch window. That the precocial chicks, um, they lay a yolk that is higher in yolk content as compared to altricial because when they hatch, they need to sit there and wait for the other siblings to hatch. And that yolk material is utilized while they're waiting for them to, um, to all leave the nest together. This is why some of the, the industries have popped up where we ship chicks. Um, I remember as a kid getting chicks in the mail, one of the more exciting things in my life to have you know, the post office call and hear the cheaping chicks and yelling at my mom, we gotta go to the post office, get the chicks. They can mail them and ship them. Sometimes it's two to three days before you get them. Obviously, that's better if they get on food and water um, the day after they hatch when they're placed on the farm, but that yolk is there and that can sustain them. Um, that allows this extra yolk, all the chicks to remain in the nest after hatch, waiting for the other chicks so they can all leave together. Um, <clears throat> this is what nature intended. All chicks feeding together, exiting together, the mother can care for them. Often when they leave that nest of the eggs, they don't often don't even go back to that same nest. The mother will stop wherever they're at to sit and care for the, care for the young. And it is so important for the um, hatch to be synchronized because the, the last dragging hatch um, hatchlings um, just won't make it. They can't follow the mother out. So nature has designed this till they all hatch together. Critically important. So when we look at the, the um, importance of this, Obviously, if you're looking at a single bird, you're going to give the utmost care of that single bird. What we are doing is we're looking at a collective group. That's our target. That's our cheese, I'd say. Um, as the old book says, who moved the cheese? That's our cheese, the chicks, the group of chicks, having quality chicks. Um, you know, people that I've worked with years, many years ago, you know, they have ostriches and these ostriches were worth incredible amount and you know you'll see them picking to help those hatch out to assist them because that single one has that much value and importance when you're talking about a collective groups like okay what's best for the group 
of chicks, not necessarily one, but for the collective group, because that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with large numbers, um, typically in our commercial operations. We know about the difference between averages and uniformity. Um, <clears throat> this is a graph I've used, um, a depiction I've used a number of times over the years, and it can apply to um, egg size, to body weight, to fleshing scores, to you know, goat growth rate, <clears throat> whatever this, in this case, we can say it's, it's incubation time. We have an average time or average weight or an average value here. And then we always have some that are off target, a little bit low end, a little bit on the high end. We're always better off when we're dealing with animals and animal kingdom, particularly birds, body weight, fleshing, whatever, to have the most uniform group of birds. Fewer birds on this high end, fewer birds on this low end, but these two groups can have the same average. But obviously the more uniform group gives us the best results. And, and we do this everywhere in the poultry industry. We, we, we shoot for uniformity, uniformity, uniformity. And I've got a series of slides here. I won't spend much time on them. It just kind of jumped out when you say how important is uniformity. You know, I, I started pulling some information off of some of our um, management guides <clears throat> from primary breeders or uh, other, other uh, equipment groups. Uniformity and live weight, uniform levels of weight we're shooting for. Um, measuring our CV values, trying to profile to have the best uniformity of a flock. That'll give us the best broilers. Um, factors that influence chick size, egg size, having a uniform egg size. Chick placement, having similar age and flock source in a single house, um, gives us the most uniform birds. Growing phase, um, having the most uniform environment where they can eat, drink, um, and sustain themselves. Uniformity is key in every one of these. Interestingly enough is when you look at um, that uniformity, one of the points of having that uniform or that good hatch window is making sure that when those birds hit the ground at the farm, they are all able, they're active enough and able to start eating and drinking at the same time, like what happened in nature. Okay, and that gives us the best environment. If you've got to go and put down chicks and sit and tell the grower, we couldn't give you enough today. Tomorrow, we're gonna bring the other half, a house of 20,000. So you've got one day's difference in that, that group of birds. Um, you, you can question how uniform that flock will be if you don't have them all starting on food and water on the same day. Um, very important. Um, uniform parent breeder flock, um, uniform body weight, you know, looking at the differences in age or immune status, making sure that they're all uniform. The, the variation in broiler live weights can be um, very costly for companies that are trying to grow birds to fit into a, a certain window that their customers want. And if we get to where we've got a very uniform group of chicks, they all started eating at different time. There's some of them were better quality than others. You know, when those go to the processing plant, if you can't get the majority of them in that target hatch or target body weight, um, it could be very costly for a, for a producer. Again, final body weight, send them off to the plant. Um, you know, is that uniform? That's, that's, our, that's our best, um, most productive flocks. Um, when we look at uh, housing environment, we want to have our housing such that our growth rate is, is uniform. They can all eat and drink at the same time. Um, <clears throat> looking at live weight again, more on uniformity. So factors that affect hatching window. And I borrowed this slide from Jason Cormick from Avigen. Um, recognize him down here. He he's, um, spoke at one of our webinars last week on, or last year on hatch window as well. And I like the way he, first of all, he's incredibly good at all his little graphics. And I always like to see his, his graphics he uses, but what is the hatch window? The time from the first hit chick that hatches to the last chick. Now, is it actually the very, very first chick or is it when you get a upward swing of first chicks hatching to the last chicks hatching? Um, and that's really what we're measuring. That hatch window was that time period. First chicks hatching to the last chicks hatching. How long did it take? between those two. One thing we wanna make sure is when we're trying to get that uniform hatch window, 
the chicks, as they're growing and developing, they go through some physiological changes where, you know, they're, they're, uh, they start pulmonary respiration, their chorioalmatose starts to um, regress. Um, these processes, because we want them to develop, to hatch at the same time, we want the development of those chicks also to be uniform. Um, I, I know when you're looking at um, like in ovo injection processes, very critical to have those chicks as uniform as possible so you can get the best um, vaccination status. Um, you don't want some developed too fast or too slow. It, it kind of hurts it. But also when we got our chicks hatching, we want them all to be at the same or as close to the same physiological state of development where they've done their internal pipping, external pipping, hatching, um, all that in a, in a more uniform manner so we can get that collective group out. <clears throat> Looking at the hatch window. So what we have here, um, when the chicks start to hatch, you can see that first big group of chicks coming off and starting to hatch here. We see a humidity increase in our humidity curve. And most incubators that we can see that in, we can follow that and see, okay, and I'll show you a picture in a little bit, a graph off of one of our um, machines that shows, okay, we can follow that humidity curve. Once, once these chicks are rapidly pipping, opening up that shell, starting pulmonary respiration, there's a lot of moisture released into that hatcher. And so we can see this. We don't necessarily have to jump in the machine every single time. There are times we do when some of our, our data looks kind of funny, but we can generally see that um, on our graphs because our humidity curve will show us that hatch window. It'll show us when that peak um, started of, of hatch. And then we can see when it started to drop. So then we can shoot for that 24 to 26 hour window. So this is um, a for Maestro looking at one of our machines. So we have here, um, this would be our hatch window. So we have our, our humidity here, we, we drop it. We can see here that the hatch starts to come off right here. We have a hat peak in the hatch window. This hatch um, window time period, about 26 hours from the time our humidity started to climb and our humidity started to drop here. It never goes all the way down where they are because we have a lot of chicks still drying off and, and stuff and, and hatch residue that's open, but we see that peak and we see the drop after that. So we have a 26 hour hatch window. We then would have from peak to pull about 18 to 20 hours. That allows the chicks time to dry off and be ready to um, be active and consume food. At this period of time, when once they've had that period of time from peak to pull, 18 to 20 hours, um, they're developed to the point their guts are ready to start utilizing feed. Some research done a number of years ago showed that um, it takes about 30 hours from the time of hatch to, from the time of hatching for their guts to really be ready to utilize feed. And that would coincide with what we see here. Um, hatch starting to come off these first chicks by the time we're pulling them, they're about 30 hours when we add that last four to six hours. And so they're, they're ready to start consuming food. They're drying off. We can't be pulling that hatch right here. We got a lot, a lot of wet chicks. And we certainly don't want to pull it. Certainly don't want to pull it too late either. So when you see this hatch window here, we've got your early chicks, your late chicks, and your mid chicks. And then we've got to adjust our feeding time um, when they're going to be on feed. And obviously these first ones and last ones, you know, have a little bit different window there, but maintaining that 24 to 26 hour window still gets all the birds and feed as nature would have been intended. To throw a little loop into this, male chicks typically hatch a little bit differently, a little bit later than our female chicks. So then we naturally are gonna have slightly two different peaks here. Um, we really are looking for that same, that normal window here, understanding that our males are a little bit slower. What happens if we get a very wide hatch window and we start pulling chicks maybe before enough of them are hatched, we'll start losing some of these male chicks that were late to hatch. Typically the ones that we lose are the late hatching ones. Typically the ones that we might lose from dehydration would be the females on the front side. So we, we're trying to preserve all of this. So what is, it, what is this like? And this, this um, analogy brought to me uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had this discussion at, at some meetings. I had to, one of our customers bring this up of hatching chicks is really like um, popping popcorn. 
So we can do it in a microwave or we can do it in one of these little poppers. We put our corn in, we start the process, the heat, mixing of the kernels, and we see this rapid popping. They're coming out. We've got, we want all these, as much popcorn as we can out of here, right? That's what we want with our chicks. We want it to, it's starting, it's going, we want it to, to go to completion. So what happens if it takes too long for all the popcorn to pop? You get nervous, stop the process so you don't burn the kernels that already popped. And they're good now. Then you get mad at how many kernels did not pop and you're still hungry and you have to pop some more. Um, why does it happen? Old popcorn. I've actually did this just recently, put a, a container of old popcorn in and they don't pop very well. Improper heat in our popcorn popper. Improper mixing of the kernels to get uniform heat. These can all cause us to not have a good batch of popcorn. When we don't, we're gonna lose some of the good ones. I, I, I know in, in a microwave popcorn, it's always that listening to them pop and it's like, okay, when is it time to stop it? You wanna get the last few kernels out, but at the same time, you know if you do, you're gonna lose the ones on the front side. Um, so we want a uniform pop just like we want a uniform hatch. So what can cause the chicks to not all hatch uniformly? Obviously, breeder age, as we move towards bigger and bigger um, incubators where most people are going to be faced with having eggs in those incubators that are not all from the same from the same breeder flock, certainly, but often not from a similar breeder flock. And so when we have big differences in breeder age, we have differences in breeder um, egg size um, due to that egg age or failure to control our body weight of our hens, we might get some are laying really big eggs and really small eggs. That can cause differences in hatch window as the chicks are trying to develop um, in the conditions that they were given. Egg storage duration. You put eggs in an incubator from, um, that have been stored four or five days, some in an incubator 10 to 12 days, we're, they're not gonna hatch uniformly because we've got egg age we can add to the equation here. But egg gathering handling prior to incubation. Um, Pre-incubation on the farm, we see some of that. They're not gathered quickly enough. Um, in some places in the world where they don't have um, the egg, egg storage on the farm, I've been in places in Africa where you got tremendous pre-incubation on some of the eggs by the time they get the hatchery. And other ones that were laid just prior to picking up, you didn't have that. You're gonna have a poor hatch window in that. Um, Improper um, pre-warming procedures. I know a lot of people. Um, a lot of people want to pre-warm. I think there's some very positives to pre-warming, but it's got to be done correctly. We cannot have. Um, let's let's put 12 buggies out in a hallway and have them all crammed together with very little ventilation through those eggs. That pre-warming is going to be improper. We're going to have eggs in the middle of that pack that never really pre-warm and eggs around the outside that are, are warming up for extended periods of time, that's gonna cause um, poor uniformity in their hatch. These usually would be sporadic aberrations in the duration of the hatch window. Not necessarily what we get every single time we hatch, unless every single time we set eggs, we are pre-warming improperly and, and, and whatnot. But most of the time we can see that, okay, we know why this happened. We had some egg age. We had some variations in storage. <clears throat> so what happens when we have that long hatch window? If it's too long, like this curve here, these first chicks out, they're gonna tend to be on dehydrated side. I know we've all seen that, I've seen it, pulling hatches out to where you've got some dehydration. Um, if it's too short, they may not have all hatched. You might be pulling that before you, everybody, all the chicks have had a chance to, to hatch out. So we want that. I actually heard people getting an 18 to hour hatch window, which I think is pushing on the edge of too short. Again, this is um, from Jason Cormick's um, presentation. You can go back and look at that in our, um, in our history of our webinars. So the overall solution is to get that good hatch window. So all the chicks collectively are removed from the hatchery, taken to the farm, and they're all ready to, ready to eat at the same time as, as nature intended. So what can cause the hatch window to be too big? If the hatch window is consistently too large, meaning week after week, day after day, we just get a big hatch window, 
there's some other things that we need to look at. There are likely what I call micro environments during the incubation process or even during the egg handling process. Micro environments are hot and cool spots, either in your egg storage or in your incubators. Um, and I'll show you an example of this in, in a little bit to where it's not necessarily wrong incubation. It's just our ventilation and our conditions in our hatchery are not conducive to really allowing a proper airflow. If, if the air is trying to be rushed through too quickly, we're going to have some, some spots that don't get the air movement. If it goes too slowly, the same thing. Poor and uniform ventilation in the setters or the hatchers. Again, that's the microenvironments there. So if we're getting that big hatch window consistently, these are the first places I'd start looking at. How about individual machines or hallways um, or the hatchery, the whole hatchery itself? We see sometimes it's like, okay, we've got a couple of machines that are always giving us an ununiform um, hatch or a certain hallway in the hatchery. We can, we can dial it down to see what the problem is and, um, and address it from that standpoint. So when you see um, hot and cool spots, we can see using thermal um, temperature mapping here. In this group of eggs, we've got some um, hotter spots in this range here and cooler up on top. What's going to happen when these when they pull this hatch? These are going to be more advanced than this group up here. And so this is a tool that we can use some time to look in our machines to see what's happening, where our hot and cool spots are. There's other ways to do this as well. But this is this is certainly one of them. Um, so poor ventilation. This can be caused by fans not working properly, um, spacing depending on the type of incubator, or often we see this just from improper um, air uh, pressure of our air for our inlet and pressure of our air in our exhaust plenums. Both of those can affect um, proper ventilation. More air flowing through the incubators is not better. It often causes a problem where the, egg, the air just comes in and right back out and never really goes through the egg. So more is not better when you're talking about ventilation and heat exchange. And then we look, again look at is it individual machines, hallways, or the hatchery itself. This is another thing that I that I look at, and this is a breakout sheet that I that I use um, when I do my breakouts, and I can summarize. Then I can summarize the the data and look all the eggs. We typically will break out eggs from the top, middle, bottom to get a uniform representation of that flock. Well, if we then break that down, say, okay, on this particular day, this was data from a hatchery I was at, um, we broke out eight flocks that day. So all the top, all the middle, all the bottom trays in this particular um, hatchery, we can see here we had higher um, total late embryo loss. Total embryo loss was over 2% higher than the other two. We had more cold chicks. We had a lot more live pips. These things here would indicate, okay, we've got a ventilation issue because our bottom of all our machines is not giving us the results the middle and the top are. This could be verse. In this case, this is what we saw. I think in another um, scenario, I saw this where we saw the middle was the worst hatching one, meaning they weren't getting proper airflow through the middle. We were getting a lot of um, dead pips that were just advancing too much because they were too hot and some exposed brains and malpositions from that. So this is another way to look at is to look at your data you have. If you don't have the ability to, you know, use a thermal um, temperature mapping in there, then we can look at, okay, what are our machines doing? Position of the buggies and racks and machines. If you really start questioning that, you can start looking at, at the positions within the machines. So the results of extreme um, hatch window, too large of a hatch window, poor quality trick chips. Um, dehydrated chicks. First one's out, we're always going to get some dehydrated chicks. We can get green chicks. We've got a 35-hour hatch window. We're trying to pull them so we don't have too many dehydrated ones. We're going to have a, a number of them that are not quite ready. Unhealed navels, often a result of our green chicks. And, 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 and especially if we see some of this, but not in every group of birds, we say, okay, we've got some um, problems here. And this is going to affect our chick quality, chick size variation. Um, chick yield extremes, higher seven day mortality. So when we go through our chick evaluation, however we score our chicks, whether we're using visual score, hydration activity, seven day mortality, hatch weights, some other methods of evaluating our hatch, moisture loss, chick yield, you know, our residue breakout, which I've talked about a number of times on here, 
hatch windows, what we're talking about today, yolk utilization, pathology of the birds, all these things that we're measuring here, if we've got a poor hatch window, we're gonna see um, losses in our chick quality and often it's measured in some of these factors. So um, what is the correct hatch window? For precocial chicks, our galliforms, our, our ground dwelling birds, chicken, turkeys, ducks, geese, pheasant, quail, whatever, a 24 to 26 hour hatch window is what nature intended. We can see by the way the eggs were developed, the way they're formed with the yolk uh, albumin content and percentages, they're developed in a manner that they should have a 24 to 26 hour hatch window. Um, that's how nature intended. If we don't see that, the goal, the goal of any hatchery or incubation program would be this 24 to 26 hour hatch window. If we're not seeing that, and we looked at some of the other causative factors like um, uh, egg age differences and whatnot, effort should be immediately put in place to correct the incubation conditions to create a more uniform environment for growing embryos and producing chicks. Uh, bottom line is, is that we need to get to what nature intended, that 24 to 26 hour hatch window. Um, there's, there's other measures that people are taking to try and address this if they can't get that hatch window and, and it's a Band-Aid. Really, it's, let's get our incubators working correctly. That's really what we're trying to do is get an environment like a mother hen does, like mother nature has dictated for our eggs. Looking at other differences in the temperature within the incubator, top versus bottom, front to back, side to side, middle versus perimeter, et cetera. Um, at any rate, we need to look at those corrective actions, whether it be the egg pack we have or our incubators themselves to get to this 24 to 26 hour hatch one knows what um, nature intended for us to do. So with that, I will finish up and I will turn it back to Cody. Hopefully he's still with us here. And um, I think we'll entertain some questions. So hopefully you're there, Cody. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. yep okay. I gotcha. Yeah, so uh, very interesting, Dr. Bramwell. That was a, a good presentation that, that I got a lot of value out. You, you actually answered most of the questions already that we have here, uh, but now would oh, be good. Yeah. <laughs> now would that, be that's, that's what you always try to do, right, is answer yeah. all the questions, but then you think maybe you didn't say enough because of your good questions. Around. But yeah, now would be a good time if anyone has any additional questions to go ahead and, and get those in. Um, but one of the questions was obviously, uh, hatch window, the same for, for turkeys, chickens and all that. And, and of course you answered that right there at the end. Um, so, so your hatch window is the same, same for all of those. Yeah, it, it should be. Cause if you look and there's a little bit difference in the, um, yolk content is my screen showing for y'all anymore or not? Uh, we're just, we see you, we're not seeing. Okay. You. Okay, good. We'll show up. Um, it, there's a little bit difference, particularly when you look at some of our wild, like the wild mallards, and there's some others that are really narrow hatch window. When we're looking at our commercial birds, and I've, I've you know, talked with people that are hatching the turkeys and ducks and stuff, I and mean, we're all shooting for that same hatch window. Um, and again, because of the, the development of that egg, and the contents yeah, of that right. egg are conducive for a 24-hour hatch window to get them all out, food and water at the same time. And then uh, another question, you know, you, you obviously mentioned uh, what the consequences are of a longer hatch window and things. One of the questions was, do you really, do you see the, in, the embryology of a early bird versus a very late bird, the, the big difference in that? Maybe their, their pulmonary system and things like that. Do you, do you see uh, a lack of development or, or is there any issue there? Not, not really development. You could have, if you've got a big hatch window and you're pulling early, one of the issues that, that you could have there, because again, it's like that popcorn. It's like, man, we, we got to get these out because mm -hmm. these first ones are going to start suffering. So you get them out before the last ones are really ready. And what, what we see sometimes there is that, you know, they've all gone through the same developmental stages and they're, they, if, they, if they haven't switched to pulmonary respiration, they're a late dead, mm -hmm. you, you know, in your dead pip in your, in your machine. But you'll have, a, have some open unhealed navels or just slightly open navels. And I, where I've seen that be a problem is, okay, these chicks look good in the hatchery. We don't really have much of an issue in the hatchery. We don't have a navel problem, but they're not completely healed up because we pulled them a little early. And then all of a sudden they get out to the field and two days later, they said, we're getting a lot of navel infection. Why, why are we getting it two days later? 
like well it's because you've got chicks that hatch had a slightly open navel they're crawling around that hatch basket and getting whatever's in their dander and whatever in that navel in 24 48 hours later we see a bloom mm -hmm. so that's one of the things you will see um, but then you'll also see the, the dehydration. I mean, as, are they not developed properly? Not necessarily, but they've been sitting there a long time. Right. You know, and, and, they, and they'll suffer. We know what happens when you, when you put, get dehydrated chicks. We're just not yeah. going to perform well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then uh, one other question, uh, which I think you've already pretty much explained that it, it's going to be the same, but there was, uh, is there any difference in a single stage and multi-stage uh, hash window? Um, Yes, there is. Um, typically, a, a single stage of a, a well, I'd say a well constructed single stage um, that's operating properly, we can give a more uniform environment from side to side, top to bottom. So we, we can control that development of all the embryos in there. When we look at a multi stage, the multi stage machines we have are good. They've been around a long time and they can produce good chicks. But it, you have to admit, when you're doing multi stage, um, you're kind of shooting for the average. You're hoping that the heat produced by the oldest embryos is enough to transfer to the youngest embryos to really get um, that uniform heat throughout that cabinet. You don't have the same heat from one end to the other. We just, we just don't in our multi-stage. So typically mm -hmm. we do see a little bit bigger hatch window in, in the multi-stage. And I've seen moving multi-stage into um, you know, new, new hatchers, and we can tighten that up a little bit, but that uniformity of the, the development process in that is, is very critical, and the multi-stage just don't quite give us the same environment mm -hmm. as uniform as a single stage does. We can't control it. Okay, well. right. Okay, uh, and, and then I saw one of the, the questions, you know, your minimum and maximum hours of hatch windows. And, and in your presentation, you said that ideal is 24 to 26 hours. Correct. Okay. And we see, and, I, and I've seen some that are, that are pushing up under 20 hours even. And, and to me, I think they're pushing them, they're, they're pushing them too hard in there. And that, that becomes a stressful thing. It's almost like they're trying to escape due to stress as fast as they can. That's not necessarily the best scenario either. With the aberration of some of these weird birds, it's like, oh, four hour hatch when everybody's hatching, we're all off and running and swimming or whatever. But we really want to stay in that 24 to 26 hour, you know, 22, even 20. But when we start getting under 20 hours, I think time to slow them down a little bit and, and let them develop a little bit better because I think we're pushing them a little bit too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, here, we've got a question from Mr. Jason Cormick. It says, hi, Keith, great <laughs> presentation. I agree hatch window is absolutely critical. But I also think sometimes there is too much emphasis on delivering chicks as soon as possible to the farm before the chicks are ready. What are your thoughts on ideal delivery times? I, I mean, I agree with that. And there's been there's been different scenarios where people have held chicks even overnight. And I, and I think the data clearly shows that, you know, when those chicks are hatched and ready, the sooner as we get them on food and water, the better. However, if we don't have a really good hatch window, if we do have a some green chicks, um, they do benefit from having that downtime to, to finish up, dry off, get a little bit of strength and, and gain food and water. If you put them out in the field and you've got 20% that are a little bit um, green still, you're going to have some chicks running all over eating and drinking. The others are going to plop down and rest mm -hmm. on the litter there. So, so yeah, I, I think I, I would agree that there's sometimes a little bit too much emphasis, but I'm not going to say, hey, let's hold them all for 24 hours to get them out there. I, I don't necessarily agree with that, although there have been good results from that scenario. But the chicks have just got to be ready. Right. And really, a, a newly hatched chick, it can't really even, its gut's not really developed. It's like 30 hours from time of hatching before its gut is really ready to start utilizing food and water and so if we just throw them out there really quick we're you know we're not we're not helping them any and we're putting them in a in a situation that they're less controlled of their environment um, as opposed to in the hatcher or whatever okay and thank you jason i noticed i borrowed a couple of your slides but <laughs> I, I put your name on the bottom so <laughs> <laughs> um so one question uh you know what is the role how critical is your hvac on the hatch window. Um, and, I, and I think that's a, a pretty critical. It, it, it absolutely is. And, I, and I'll, I'll say, you know, one of the, one of the first visits I did um, when I, you know, came on board with James, I 
I've, I've been working with them for 12, 14 years and in a different capacity, just assisting. But I, I went to Hatchery and they just had a brand new machines and they had a spot in there where every time we did a breakout, we were getting a lot of um, late deads, mm -hmm. you know, just choked out. And what happened is they did not have the proper room environment. They actually had slightly negative pressure in their intake air. Mm -hmm. And so those machines couldn't pull it in enough. So as it was pulling it in, it was shorting out and running right back out and it wasn't circulating right. So, you know, it goes back to that book from hundred years ago where they said, oh, you got to have a proper environment where it's 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 maintained right and our and our machines will try to do everything they can to hit the set points that we give them but the better environment we make the plenum the exhaust air and then the the intake air a little bit positive on the front end a little bit negative on the back end it just helps that machine to operate better and doesn't have to work so hard when it doesn't have to work so hard we get a more uniform air airflow through um, our equipment. So it, it, absolutely, it's incredibly critical to mm -hmm. have our ventilation system working properly. Okay. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, does early feeding in hatchers, uh, such as hatch care machines, minimize the effect of long hatch window? So that's a, that's a big... Yeah, it, it actually would. It, you know, for instance, if you've got a 36 or 40 hour hatch window, and that's what it is. I mean, it, it'd be like, okay, so those first ones out there, they obviously need something before we get them out of the hatch or they're going to be dehydrated and they're going to be on the, the bad side. So yeah, if your hatch window is, is long and big, if they were, were given food and water in that first stage, yeah, you would kind of repair or, or uh, salvage some of those early chicks. Um, but again, to me, it looks like, okay, so if we've got this big hatch window, do we try and salvage them in some way or do we try and fix the scenario that's causing us to have a big hatch window? That, that's where I look at it. Yeah. But, but it does. It, it, it will actually salvage some of those that have been stressed. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here's a question for early or, or late deads. Um, you know, is it because of bad farm management, uh, not the right environment, an incubator or some other contaminations? I think this is something that it could be several factors. So if you just want yeah. to. Well, well, I, I mean, and I'll just use some generalities here. Um, and I'll talk to you later about it and we can really look at it if you yep. want. But yep. typically what I see, what I've seen over my years is if we get high early embryo mortality, that first week mortality, zero to three to four to seven, it's rarely the incubator. I mean, it's something before that. I say mm -hmm. something before that. You had peaks and valleys of temperature. We've seen farms where they have six to eight degree Fahrenheit swings between night and day on the on-farm egg rooms. It's, it's egg age, it's you know, transportation. We've got some temperature fluctuations in transportation. Typically our early dead is uh, just don't waste your time looking at the hatchery, waste, you know, spend your time looking at what's happening to the eggs before they go in the incubator. When we move to late deads, most of that is going to be our incubator and hatcher conditions. And when I do my breakout, I have like a 15 to 18 and I have a 19 to 21. So I split before transfer, after transfer. And that's where we can start looking. And then, you know, we can go into a lot of detail on that. But that in generalities, your early deads typically are not the incubator. Your late deads are either incubator or hatcher um, issues. And then we go from there. So. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so I think that's uh, answered a lot of the, the critical ones that really deal with this uh, presentation. Uh, there are a few other questions where uh, you, you guys can email us separately uh, to, to help answer some of the, the questions that are kind of not, not related to this presentation. But um, Dr. Bremo, if you have anything else to add, I think that will, will some. No, no, I, I am. I'd, I'd be glad to discuss any of this with anybody at, at another time. Um, you know, if you if you didn't get my email from the very beginning or don't have it, you know, you can contact James Way at their homepage and they, they can get that get that to you. But um, or submit questions to the, the webinars things and they, those questions come back to us afterwards. But I'd be glad to discuss anything, any of this with you at all. But um, yeah, there's there's always a lot of questions. 
a lot of discussion that can be had on this. I could have talked for hours on this, but yeah. trying to narrow it down into a speaker window, right? <laughs> the yeah. time I have to speak. So, well, I appreciate you letting me be a part of this webinar. is very uh, interesting, and and uh, I enjoyed it. So, uh, I guess that's uh, that's all we have for now. All right. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Cody. Thank you.